and back. Oh, 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 oh. God damn it. Oh, is that you, Adam? Oh, 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 oh it's fucking everywhere. Oh, oh, it's spraying all over me. Oh, oh, no. Oh, Jesus. Oh, oh, no. Oh, this is going on. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. How was your break, Adam? I had a wonderful break. How was yours? So what did you do? <laughs> Whoa! Hello YouTube, this is Adam Noyce of AN Productions, and welcome to this review for Frank Darabont and Stephen King's The Mist. Alright, uh, I just got done watching the movie. I have no notes, and I'm just going to speak my mind while watching the film. I'm not even going to look at the timer, so I don't know how long or how short this video is going to be. I also apologize that there is no camera. Uh, however, my videos are mainly, you're, you're supposed to listen to more than actually watch, so whatever. Truth is, is I'm not at my my apartment anymore. Um, I'm at a house right now. I'm at a different house, and I forgot to bring my camera, so that's why there's no camera set up. So please forgive me for that. But again, you're supposed to listen to these more than you are to watch them. I have a lot of nostalgia for this film. I first watched this film when I was in eighth grade, so that was six, seven years ago. I wasn't able to watch it in theaters. I really wanted to because this film was like right up my alley. I love giant monster movies. Everybody knows that. And this film looked right up my alley. It makes giant monsters with horror and it it was right up my alley. Uh, I wasn't able to see it in theaters because none of the theaters around here plays good movies. And so I wasn't able to see it. However, when it finally came on sci-fi and television and so on and so forth and HBO before we got too cheap and had to get rid of HBO, you're damn right, I watched the shit out of this movie. I absolutely adored it. I watched it while we were making Don't Tread On Me, quite frequently. And though this film really didn't influence Don't Tread On Me that much, um, it did influence the track of part one of the film, um, The Host of Sir Ferillium, something like that. Um, anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a choral piece that has a very poetic singer. Yes, I am a fan of the poetic singer, and I'm not afraid to admit that. What was funny was that I used that song for the end credits to part one of Don't Tread On Me. And then after that, when after I'd done editing that scene and stuff and did the end credits, after that I watched this movie. And so when I originally aired it before it was taken down on Chopper Pilot 5, my old channel, people were like, nice use of the Mist music there, Adam. And I said, in all honesty, it was a complete coincidence that they happened to be played at the same time. Uh, <laughs> But that, that aside, that was just an interesting story, but I, I genuinely, I watched the shit out of this movie. And this is kind of like a black cat. Frank Darabont has made three Stephen King movies. Uh, he's made, based on Stephen King's book, he made Shawshank Redemption, um, The Green Mile, and The Mist. And if he's made another one, I'm not sure. I'm not too familiar with Frank Darabont's filmography, despite the fact that I'm a big fan of the guy. I respect him a lot. Um, and he's also a huge 
a huge advocate for kaiju, giant monster movies, science fiction films, horror films. I mean, that's what he started off working with, and he loved these films to death. His favorite movie is King Kong, for God's sakes. Um, and he also wrote my favorite scene from the new Godzilla film. He wrote the scene with um, Brian Cranston going to find his wife in a nuclear reactor. Frank Darabont wrote that. Uh, he wrote that scene specifically, and it's my favorite scene in the goddamn movie. I immensely love Frank Frank Darabont. I was introduced to him actually through Peter Jackson when I was watching the behind-the-scenes footage of the making of King Kong. Peter Jackson had Frank Darabont on set quite a bit because, you know, they're a buddy-buddy. However, this film was a lot more independent than, than both The Green Mile and Shawshank Redemption. Those movies had surprisingly low budgets, but this film had a budget of $18 million. And nowadays, if this kind of film was being made, uh, especially in, in the, this new era of shit motion pictures, I'm looking at you, Marvel, this, this time period of films, this would have had like hundreds of millions of dollars put into it. I'm, I'm guessing like maybe 120 million. And Frank Darabont made it for 18 million. Uh, and, and because of the, this film made a very hefty profit back, it made $56 million back. It was a very kind of small release, again, it being surprisingly independent for Frank Darabont. The critical reaction to this movie was very mixed, um, and, and I think that a lot of that came from the whole fact that this is kind of the black sheep for Frank Darabont. And it's kind of ironic, because Frank Darabont says he actually prefers this movie to Shawshank and The Green Mile. The Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile are both fantastic films. I actually saw them after The Mist. This was the movie to introduce me to The Mist, or introduce me to Frank Darabont. And those, those films were fantastic, um, but they're a completely different style to this film. Those, those are... Green Mile and Shawshank are, are without a shadow of a doubt in the art category of film. Then we have this film here. And critics didn't know how to react to it because it was so different from Frank Darabont. Instead of those like sweeping, beautiful imagery um, that he tended to use in, in both Shawshank and Green Mile, this film went with a much grittier look, went with a much grittier in-your-face kind of look. Mist looked completely different. And though I didn't know it at the time, I didn't know this at the time, a year later, after I saw this film, that was when I started making Forest of Blood and started making the Zeke trilogy. It turned out that what Frank Darabont wanted to do with this film was to make it look like Night of the Living Dead, a very independent kind of look where the, the camera is always moving, where the camera movements are very improvised, um, and, and, and he wanted to make it look extremely grainy. Uh, while The Green Mile and Shawshank are very beautiful and very crisp and very clear with their images, this movie is very grainy. Originally, they were going to start shooting it on, on digital, which is what, of course, everybody shoots on now. And I, I'll be honest, I'm a fan of digital because I can play around with it more. But he th said it looked too clean, so he used a Japanese camera, and that created the grain that he liked. And th this film, stylistically, is, is so different from the other two that critics, again, didn't quite know how to react to that. And quite frankly, I, I like it. This movie doesn't really have shaky cam. I want to make that clear right now. This is not true shaky cam. This is restless cam movements. It's done and it makes sense. It's done with a purpose. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of the cinematography in this movie. Knowing now that this was it was it was shot that way as a homage to George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. I appreciated it more. Uh, when I found that stuff out. And there actually is, on the Blu-ray, another cut of the film. I do not have the Blu-ray. I watched this version of the film online. Frank Darabont originally wanted this movie to be in black and white. Um, and before, just recently, this previous movie that I just got done watching, or not, I literally just finished watching the movie, and I'm just talking out of my ass right now. I'm kind of pulling a cannibal holocaust here. I just really wanted to talk about this film. Frank Darabont wanted it in black and white, and the producer said no, and so it kind of had um, the Mad Max Fury Road thing. The director of Mad Max Fury Road wanted it to be in black and white and actually completely silent, but the studio said no. Uh, and so, luckily, there's a fan edit online, which it is silent and only has the music for the film in it. And that is a masterful cut of the film. I prefer it to the theatrical cut. But here we actually finally get to see the film in black and white, and I actually like the f film better in black and white because it even looks grainier. It really does look like Frank Darabont wanted to, to make it as a homage to Night of the Living Dead. It looks and feels exactly like Night of the Living Dead. 
and I, I admire it for that. There was a, there were, again this there is a reason why the camera is shaky throughout the film. There's a reason why this happens. It isn't just out of chaos. It isn't just because they were too cheap to actually choreograph something like in a lot of Hollywood films. Um, they had a reason why the camera was constantly moving. And the reason why the camera's constantly moving in Night of the Living Dead was because they didn't really have a tripod. <laughs> um, George Romero didn't have a tripod, and so Frank Darabont had the camera moving a lot. And the camera movements, there are some camera movements in this film that are really cool and really innovative. And are, are really cool. But another thing that is really awesome with this film, and that I love about it, <laughs> is that um, he also said that he wanted to pay homage to the pre-color Ray Harryhausen movies. Frank Darabont was a huge fan of Ray Harryhausen. Um, rightfully so. That man is fucking awesome. May he rest in peace. So that's why we have a lot of these these monsters with tentacles as a reference to It Came From Beneath the Sea and uh, so on and so forth. And actually, there are these spider thingies that are in the film. Uh, first off, the, the, the designs of the monsters in this are absolutely cool and innovative. I really like them. But the, the, the monsters in this film, the spider thingies, look directly as a reference from pictures from the Lost Spider Pit sequence in the original King Kong. And another thing with these monsters is they look straight like something f f written by H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, there is this, at the ending, there is this great sweeping shot, and I love this shot, of this, this four-legged monster just walking in front of the car that the people escape from. And... It looks like Cthulhu. It looks like something out of H.P. Lovecraft. And there, without a shadow of a doubt, he had that in mind. You can't convince me that he didn't have H.P. Uh, Lovecraft in mind with a lot of these tentacle monsters and stuff, because that's why H.P. Lovecraft is. He uses a lot of tentacle monsters, and quite frankly, I think he'd be a huge fan of Pente. What's interesting about the film is that... what what. This isn't like the other two that was trying to tell a story and so on and so forth, and that was it. There's something deeper with this film, and th this goes into Stephen King's story as well. I can tell with the style of this film and everything like that that Frank Darabont at this time was getting into his idea for The Walking Dead. Not only that, but the creature makeup effects and the makeup effects in general, the blood and gore stuff, was done by Greg Nicotero, who would later go on and work with him on The Walking Dead before Frank Darabont got screwed over by AMC. This feels like a precursor to The Walking Dead because if you look at there are a lot of similarities. This is the it's the it's the apocalypse, right? Um, it's shot very similarly. Like if you watch the pilot episode for The Walking Dead, which is phenomenal. I love that pilot. And you watch this film, they are so similar. And not even that, but they also have a lot of the same cast members. The girl who plays Andrea plays in this movie. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Demon, I think his name Demon. He's one of my favorite actors. And, I, I, and he plays Dale in The Walking Dead. He's here. Um, there's a lot of... And the girl who plays Carol ha is in the movie very briefly at the beginning. Basically playing the same character from the first few seasons of The Walking Dead. It was like he was gearing up to make it, right? And I feel like this movie very much so inadvertently influenced a modern zombie movie because a lot of modern zombie movies now are, are very much like we're, hold, we're held up in an area and they kind of dissect pieces of society. I fell into this hole as well. And I'm not saying that they're bad. It's just done a lot now. Um, it, it, it isn't unique to... It's, it isn't like The Mist did it and made it very definitive. There were other films before that. I mean, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, so on and so forth. But there has been a resurgence of this kind of story where, you know, it, the whole zombie stuff is, is basically a representation of society falling apart. And The Walking Dead is by... It, it, the Walking Dead basically kickstarted it. And... This movie inadvertently, I think, influenced that because this film, without a shadow of a doubt, is very much so about the structures of society and how quickly it can fall apart. This film only takes place over like the course of like three, four days, and people become religious fanatics, and all form people are murdered by other people, and so on and so forth. It just shows how quickly society has fallen, and I, and I tapped into that. I feel in my film Lake of Death. In many ways, I have this to thank inadvertently because I was inspired by The Walking Dead. Frank Darabont was inspired to make The Walking Dead because he made this movie. And then, it's, it's so on and so forth. You see, it's a cycle. Uh, and 
I, I owe this movie a lot. And each character in the film kind of represents a certain aspect of society. Um, and also, an interesting note, I'm all over the place here. Um, an interesting kind of note. This film doesn't have big actors in it. It has a lot of kind of up-and-coming actors, a lot of character actors. And that was done both because of the financial situation of the movie, having a very tiny budget for a Hollywood film like this, or a Hollywood film on this scale. And also because Frank Darabont again wanted to pay homage and respects to George Romero, who did the same goddamn thing. The, the performances in the movie in general are so good. They are all generally great, so props both to the actors and props to the director for being able to pull such a performance out of them. And the number one reason for that, I have to say, is Mrs. Carmody, uh, who, who is the religious fanatic woman, and her performance in this film is so good. I, I mean, she's nuts, and you can see it in her eyes. For, for example, there's a scene where the soldier is she's calling him Judas and stuff like that because he he didn't really know what was going on with the mist but he was a part of it inadvertently and she's calling for him to be killed and you can see how insane she is with her eyes how he, she she just stares at him and so on and so forth and she's drinking her milk she gives a great fantastic performance one that kind of reminds me of Adolf Hitler in many ways um, which kind of brings us back to the whole thing Mrs. Carmody represents the kind of fanaticism that comes out of desperation. When times are desperate, in fact, there's a great part. Um, Ollie, there's a character named Ollie um, who says a great line in the film. Ollie, for, for the record, is my favorite character in the film. <laughs> I love Ollie. We'll get to him a little later. Dale from The Walking Dead. He says, they'll turn to whoever offers a solution. And here's, and, and here's Mrs. Carmody completely nuts, completely off her mind, and us, as in a regular society, sits back and just watch her, everyone goes to her, everyone follows her, because she's offering the, she's the only person offering a full-on solution to what the hell is going on, and how this is the wrath of God, and everything like that, and clearly this is, you know, a stand-in for Hitler, a Hitler-esque kind of person, where Germany was in a desperate uh, situation, they needed a scapegoat, uh, so he blamed the Jews. Here, um, she needed a scapegoat to blame God's wrath, or what she felt was God's wrath, and she put it on um, both the main character, David, and this poor army guy. She that was their scapegoat, and she and, and it's great. Um, I love it, and you have Thomas Jane. Thomas Jane, um, who is kind of an unknown, uh, he's still unknown, he played for a little while in a show on HBO called Hung, which is about a male prostitute, and that's the only thing I really notice him from, but he's in this, um, and he's kind of the righteous father figure. I mean, he first off, he's got a great relationship in this film. He's a loving dad. He's not too angry um, at anything because there's this whole setup and very awkward tense situation between both him and his neighbor and uh, David and his neighbor and they're suing each other all the time and, and they don't like each other but after the storm that comes through they kind of work together for a little bit and then they get trapped in the in, in, in the store together he's a father figure he's got his son um, his relationship with the son is extremely well uh, well done, and a testament to Frank Darabont's technique, Frank Darabont's writing style, because Frank Darabont really pays attention to detail, and in this film I actually think it's to an even more extreme than in Shawshank and Green Mile. Uh, and a great example of that is when, after they get attacked by this mon by these flying monsters and these bugs, after the, everything calms down, there's this guy who's been burnt, and he's like, we gotta knock him out. And he's like, we're gonna go to the pharmacy, which is right down the street. And so he leads the group, and they go out to the pharmacy. Before that, he goes up to his son. Uh, David goes up to his son, and um, says, I'll get you a comic book while I'm over there. With a smile, clearly trying to lighten the tone of the situation. And what's interesting is as soon as he walks into the mall, I just caught it on this viewing. This is why I love Frank Darabont. You can completely overlook it, but it, it goes into the character development stuff. Um, when he walks into the mall, 
the father says, all right, let's grab the stuff and let's get the fuck out of here. And as when he's saying that, there's this kind of wide shot of him casu like quickly grabbing a comic book and stuffing it into his pocket. I adore that. Other things that I, re that I really like about it is that they, they, this film foreshadows a lot of stuff. The girl at the beginning who plays Carol in The Walking Dead, she, she's saying, I need to go get my children. And so she leaves, and we think, oh god, she's dead. At the very ending of the film, which we're going to talk about that ending later, um, because I love this ending. <laughs> uh, and if you know this ending, oh my god. You, <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, anyways, so you, you see her on a truck driving by, and she's fine, and her kids are fine. Which is so ironic, considering the fact that everybody told her to stay, and everybody who told her to stay winds up going nuts and starts killing each other out of fear and out of hatred, which goes back into that society thing. It's full. It's full of great characters. Um, it, it is. It, it's full of great characters. Um, this film is very character driven. It's not very plot driven because there really isn't a plot. The plot is very simple. We have to survive this. A typical kind of zombie apocalypse style kind of movie. Instead, replace the zombies with freakish Cthulhu-like creatures. We also have the, the girl who plays Andrea in The Walking Dead. She's in this film. She, she's a teacher. And what, what I like about her is that she's clearly set up to be kind of like a, a romance interest for David, even though he has a wife. And we find out that his wife dies at the end of the movie anyways. And it's actually a very sad scene. Thomas Jane gives a very good performance in that sequence. You see the loss and the pain and the and the brief bit of dismissal, and then all of a sudden he just breaks down. A great bit of emotion that takes place in less than 30 seconds of the film, and you see every range of emotion right there and then. I'm just gonna call her Andrea. Andrea from The Walking Dead. Um, Andrea is like... You, you think that they're gonna get together, and what I like is that they don't. Um, there is no side love story. Well, there is one, but we'll get to that a little later. There is no side story or anything, and or with the romance between Andrea and David. And what happens is that she just kind of becomes a maternal figure for the son. And I'm very glad that they left it at that. It didn't need to be anything more than that. Uh, and though the though David and Andrea clearly have kind of an affection towards each other, it's nothing more than a respect kind of relationship. And that's all. Um, and I really do appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that they didn't cop out and do a, and do a romance like I did in Compound of Chaos. I'm glad they left it at just a respect level relationship and that's all. Um, and I really do appreciate that. And the scenes where that really comes out, I feel, is when David decides to go to the pharmacy and he makes the plan. And he tells his son that he's going to be okay and everything like that, and that he's going to give him a comic book. We already discussed that. But then he goes over to uh, Andrea and says, if something happens to me, I want you to take care of my boy. You know, that level of respect and that level of trust there. And it also helps that she was also a teacher and everything. And it's even kind of brought up that th there should be a relationship there because... Um, Andrea's husband, it's explained early on in the film, that her husband is away and everything like that. And so she's all alone. David's all alone. And I'm like, oh god, they're going to do a romance, but they don't. And I, I can't praise Frank Darabont enough for not doing a cop-out. I have not read the book by Stephen King. I have not. So I don't know if they actually got together in the story or not. But... I'm glad that they don't hear. What I would have got rid of, however, is there is this story played by Samuel Witwer, who is known for a lot of sci-fi now, um, and he's smoking hot. He has this romance with this girl that is in, um, who is, who basically bags people's food at the store that where everyone's trapped in. And there is a slide romance there, um, which is in a scene, a really forced scene that I don't really care for, where they're in a closet together and they're like, I, I knew I, you always were nice to me and everything like that. And she goes, I, I know you like me, why didn't you do anything? And um, the soldier goes, I, I don't know, I was just too scared to. And then they start making out. Literally the next scene, the bugs crash through the windows, and she gets bitten on the neck. First off, great effects by Greg, Greg Nicotero, the swelling up. It's like it's like a black fly bite times infinity. It just swells up her entire neck and closes off her, her, her jugular, and she can't breathe, and she dies. However, it does explain why he's more down 
to Earth later on in the film and why he's more involved later on in the film. And it also explains why he's so distant from his other friends. You see, there's these two other soldiers there who wind up hanging themselves because they realize that they're to blame for all this. They wind up hanging themselves in the meat locker. And what I would have done differently to explain all of this is I would have cut out that romance. But I wouldn't have had those soldiers have anything to do because it's explained in the film that the mist was created by this this top secret mission that takes place on this high mountain range by this town. The scientists open the portal to another dimension to see the, what's in the other dimension and because of the, the the massive storm and everything, the power went out and our dimension and theirs interlinked and their dimension with all these monsters came spewing out into our world. I hate that. Granted, there are worse things that could have been explained that, that, that could have been the worst thing I think that you could have done is had these be aliens. I think that's the worst thing you possibly could have done. I would have preferred it significantly if they did not say what what this mist fucking was, is if it just came out of nowhere. You could still inference that it came from that military base because of all those army trucks going by. And by dialogue that's explained through characters explaining what's going on up at the uh, army base. Because there was some great dialogue at the beginning of the movie being like, it came from the army base and stuff like that. You could have left it at that and I would have been perfectly okay. I would have had these three soldiers literally have nothing to do with that. I would have had them be on shore leave from whatever, which they were about to go on shore leave, but I would have had them already on shore leave and I wouldn't have had them in uniform. I would have had them just be buddies hanging out. Um, and what happens is people recognize them because this is a small town and in small towns, because I grew up in one, everybody knows everything. <laughs> everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everything about everybody and I would have had them being recognized as soldiers and so on and so forth and that's that's what leads to what happens a little later uh, on in the film I still would have had the two soldiers hanging themselves leaving that one soldier all alone and I would have still kept the scene where Mrs. Carmody gets all of her posse together and just flat out blatantly murder this young boy I would have kept that scene in um, and I would have had all the characters be angry at him, including David. What's interesting is that David is also very angry in the movie. He's very angry at at uh, the, the soldier boy because he didn't say anything. He kept his mouth shut because he kind of knew what caused all this. What I would have done is I would have had him be angry, but then I would have had him calm down because really the soldier would not have had any idea what's going on. He was stationed somewhere else. I would have had it where he genuinely has no idea what's going on, and he is still freaking out, but of course, none of Mrs. Carmody's posse believes in him, and so they flat out murder him and throw him out to the beast where he's eaten. I would have kept that still the same, but I would have cut out that romance with that with that female character. I would have cut out her death, despite the fact that the makeup is amazing. I probably just would have cut out her character in general, because she has no purpose to the plot at all. She, uh, she, she doesn't really have a character at all, other than the fact that she kind of served as a love interest that went nowhere. That's actually, I think, believe my biggest complaint with the film is the explanation of the mist, what, where the mist came from and what happened. I would have left it completely ambiguous, um, and, I, and I would have left it um, completely up to the audience having to pick and choose pieces of information that is explained through exposition throughout the film where you inference where it's coming from. I feel like that would be a lot better than having it spoon-fed to you, and I did this in Compound of Chaos. This is why Compound of Chaos sucks, ladies and gentlemen, where I explained everything about the virus that creates the zombie apocalypse. In hindsight, I would have inferenced where you had to connect the dots what did it. I want to flat out said it. Um, and I believe that that would have done a lot better here. You see, I've grown and evolved, and, and so on and so forth, and... At the same time, there is also this old lady in the film who was a teacher, and I love her to death because she is a complete and total badass. When Mrs. Carmody is going crazy and is explaining why we're all going to hell and so on and so forth, she throws a can of peas at Mrs. Carmody and says, shut up, you miserable buzzard, <laughs> which made me laugh. And then Mrs. Carmody goes, you old bitch, and starts running at her just to show more of the insanity and the hypocrisy of Mrs. Carmody's character. Then the old lady, after after Mrs. Carmody is kind of subdued by everyone, she says, 
It's perfectly all right to stone people. They do it in the Bible, don't they? And I've got lots of peas. And she holds up another can. I'm like, this lady's a badass. Give this lady a medal. And then she also um, doesn't stay behind when they go to the pharmacy. She goes to the pharmacy with them. And what's cool is she's very inventive. She knows she knows because she works with children. And she works in a, in a school. She knows a lot of like what what's good for antibiotics. She knows about she knows a lot of stuff. And what's cool is she takes this can of air freshener and lights a match and uses it as a flamethrower. This old lady, and I mean she's an old lady, um, and she uses it to kill some of the bugs that are coming after them and everything. And oh god, she's she's just a complete badass, and I love her to death. And this is why you don't fuck around with old ladies. Another thing that I would have changed with this film. I know I'm all over the place, and I apologize. Um, another thing I would have changed about this film is I wouldn't have had to take place just over the course of three, four days. Three, four days. I would have had this take place over the course of a couple weeks, because I think the couple weeks things would have made the whole thing with them falling into the hands of Mrs. Carmody make more sense, because I would have it where they start running out of food, maybe because the power's out, stuff starts going bad, and so on and so forth, and they become the people are becoming more desperate. In my opinion, I believe people wouldn't go apeshit insane quite this quickly. They would go insane, don't get me wrong, because again, it's a line in the film said by Ollie, if you take away, you know, their phone, their electricity and the authorities, people will do anything. But what happens is because it takes place over three or four days, I feel like it's a little too rushed. Now, there is this one character, however, where I think the rushedness kind of works. There's this one character who is kind of trying to be a macho man, right? I forgot this character. He's very redneck-like. And then all of a sudden, when he sees the monster, he's, he constantly is kind of trying to one-up David. And this character, I forgot his name, but he wears the red cap and everything, sees this monster. And while this poor bag boy is getting dragged out by this monster, he is just watching with his mouth open because he's too afraid to do everything anything while David and his friend Ollie who is a back, who is who is the assistant manager of the store are doing everything they can to try to save this kid even though they fail and it's it's actually kind of sad the dialogue in that scene is great too because all of a sudden that guy the guy with the red cap goes yo man I'm sorry how was I supposed to know what you meant you needed to be more specific when, because he didn't believe in David and then David just walks over and punches him and said, did you see what they did? Did you see what that thing did? That boy is dead now because of you and I got his fucking blood on me. The dialogue in this movie is great. Another great performance by David and both the guy who plays the guy in the red hat. He gives a genuine great performance and he starts snapping at that point, but he's still kind of trying to be brave and he's trying to be proactive. And so he goes out to the pharmacy, but then he immediately panics, right? When, as soon as the bugs start coming out, um, and when he runs back, he immediately goes to Mrs. Carmody and just completely snaps. And he joins her. I would have kept that. I loved how quickly he, he switches over to Mrs. Carmody. And I, I, and I love how it looks more like a mental thing than anything else. He's just so desperate to feel safe that he goes with Mrs. Carmody, who is offering safety. Um, I would have kept that very much so intact, but I still overall would have had the movie take place over the course of a couple weeks. There is a character named Ollie in this film, and Ollie is a complete and total badass, because he's like a geek, right? He's like a geek, and you kind of don't expect him to do anything. And I knew I was going to like him, not only because he helps David try to save the kid, but immediately when he comes back, he opens up a can of liquor and starts drinking it, um, because he's also got blood on him. And the, the store manager comes back. He's like, are you drinking? My God, do you want me to make a report on you? Do you want to lose your job? And Ollie just looks at him and goes, okay, okay, listen. You can write me up all you want. Now shut the fuck up and listen. I love that line. Uh, that's, that immediately made me like Ollie. And Ollie is also good with a pistol. He's had training. Um, he, was, he, he won several awards for his marksmanship. And so it may, he knew how to handle a gun and stuff like that. Th this is why I kind of like the small town setting. Is that you have all these kind of characters. And you never know who you're going to be with. I love this kind of setting. And he's the guy with the pistol. And he is a very good shot. And it, like... <laughs> There are some really tense moments where he's got to make a tough call. There's a sequence where, like, these bird things break into the store, and he's trying to shoot him, but both David and David's kid are in the way. And so quickly, 
David grabs his son and jumps out of the way, and Ollie takes the shot less than a split second later, and it's a very tense moment, very well done, very well directed, and I felt that the shaky cam actually worked in that because it added a lot to the chaos of the sequence, and it wasn't over the top. I could actually understand what the fuck was going on. And another thing with this film is that no one dies an honorable death. Now, I prefer how these people these people die normal deaths, like how a normal person in the background would die. Now, I like that, and but now that I've said that, I've also said in many chats that I've done, in many live shows that I've done, why don't you like the deaths in The Walking Dead? That's because in The Walking Dead, and Greg Nicotero has been quoted for saying this, is that they go way too over the top with it. The greatest example is Herschel's death. Herschel's death in season four, spoilers, sorry, he dies. Um, is so overly done and so brutal that it honestly made me laugh. And here, it's it actually isn't done like that. Here it's like, oh my god, he's dead. It's a level of shock value because when Ollie dies, all of a sudden he's just picked up by this crab thingy and eaten in like a span of like five seconds. And you're like, oh my god. Now let me talk about that ending. <laughs> that ending is fucked up, okay? So what happens is at the ending, the, the David... The school, the old school teacher lady, Dale from The Walking Dead, and Andrea all get in the car with his son, and they drive off until they run out of gas. Now, when they run out of gas, they realize that oh Jesus, we're kind of stranded out here in the middle of the mist, and anybody stranded out in the middle mist in the middle of the mist is just going to get devoured and eaten by these people, or by these crazy things. So they they sign a suicide pact essentially, and so they load the pistol, and there's five of them in this car. And there's only four bullets. So David says, I will kill all of you at the expense of me. And they all agree. First off, great performance, especially on Jeffrey DeMond, because as soon as he loads the pistol and cocks it, they're all just looking at each other. Jeffrey DeMond is just kind of staring out into the distance. And it is very much so the look of somebody pondering about his life. It's got a mixture of happiness to it. It's got a mixture of sorrow to it. It's got a it's got a level of wonder to it. Wonderful performance. This is why Jeffrey DeMunn is one of my favorite actors of all time. I love him, and if I could put him in one of my films, I would. He deserves a lot more crap than what he has been in. <laughs> so David shoots them all, <laughs> including his son, by the way. And great performance by David because he's just livid and screaming at this point, covered in his son's own blood. And so he goes outside and he hears what sounds like a monster and he's like, come on, eat me. But it's not a monster, it's a tank, an army tank. And suddenly the mist clears and you see the army has liberated a bunch of people and are evacuating them to a safe shelter and they're taking and they're killing all of these monsters. And so you're left like, oh my god, if he waited five more minutes, they would have been alright. This, in my opinion, is even more of a middle finger for an ending than the ending to the last two episodes of Neon Genesis Evangelion. This ending is, is, is the definition, in my opinion, of a fuck you ending. This is even worse than the ending to The Birds, where they just get in a car and drive off. This ending is so, so evil. There is nothing good with this ending. Nothing at all. And then, of course, he sees Carol from The Walking Dead drive by with her kids. If he just went with her, she, he would have been fine. All of this would not have happened if he just went with her. This is why the ending is so terrible, and I love it. I love it. I love this style of fuck you endings. Um, this is a good fuck you ending. This isn't like a lazy fuck you ending, like Mass Effect 3. This this is a good fuck you ending, where you're just like, oh my god. And, you, and you're just left there, just uh, hanging your head in pure shame, in pure disgust at what you just saw. And it's so tragic and so sad. And I know that this ending is different than the book. I don't know how the book ends, but I know that this is this is different than in the book. But I don't care. This ending is so good. And I love how the end credits has almost no music at all. It's nothing but the sound of helicopters and tanks going by and army chit-chat going on over radios. Just to kind of drive the point home that everything you just watched has kind of not only been in nothing and been in vain, but we've also seen David, this great character, this great proactive character who is a genuinely good person and a good father who honestly thought he was doing the right thing for his kid, realized that he just killed, in many ways, his friends. He just killed his son, for Christ's sake. It's so sad. Uh, <laughs> it's so sad. Oh, my God. You just left. 
completely devastated by this ending, um, and I love it for that reason. <laughs> um, what do I give this movie? Yeah, it has problems, but fuck it. I'm, I'm going to give this three and a half out of four stars. I really genuinely like this movie, um, not just for nostalgia value. It's, I think it's a good film. I think it's a fun film. And I would, ra I would watch this movie more on a regular basis than I would Shawshank or Green Mile. Yeah, I have to be in a certain mood to watch those movies. Here, I would just watch this regularly at any time and still have fun watching it in a good way. And so that's why I gave it that rating and I heavily enjoy it. So do hit the like button, hit the comment button on what you think of this film. Hopefully you liked it. If not, you can tell me how horrible of a human being I am. I'm okay with that as well. Subscribe. Stay tuned for more reviews. Go on Facebook, like AIM Productions for up-to-date information about everything I'm doing, including short films. Like the Godzilla Saga, we we're almost at 400 likes. Um, and if you wish, if you're a geek like I am and want to promote your stuff, join our group, Geeks for Geeks. Which is where you can be who you were born to be. That's our catchphrase. And you can promote yourself and promote what you like. And you can just have wonderful conversations with people. We are all friendly and we're all insane. So welcome to the madness if you join us. So in the end, this is Adam Noyce of Van Productions saying sayonara. What is going on at the Mark, stop. Stop <laughs> laughing. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> this shit's too funny. <laughs>